In this lesson, we're going to talk about how cells respond to stress and injury. It's important for nurses to understand the potential causes of cellular injury and how cells might react when they are stressed. Our cells respond to their internal environment, and the way they respond essentially sets the stage for how we as an organism will respond to external stimuli. So, for example, if you're hot, then your cells are also responding to the heat. If you get electrocuted, then your cells will respond to the electricity locally with burns and probably worse. Keep in mind that our cells want to be efficient. You might even think of them as lazy. They don't spend resources where resources are not needed. So when cells aren't being used, they may shrink or they may even die. Cells are able to respond or adapt to both increased and decreased demands. This is usually done by changing gene expression basically by changing the proteins that each cell is expressing. They might go so far as to become a totally different cell, and that's what happens in the case of a cancer. Some adaptations or changes are reversible, but if cells can't overcome the stressor, then they may not survive. Atrophy is when the cell and, as a result, the tissue or the organ becomes smaller. This usually happens when some type of cell damage occurs. This is actually advantageous to the organism because when the cells get smaller, they decrease their oxygen consumption. So they have fewer and smaller organelles, which are the little working organs within a cell, and they don't have to support nearly as many of them. This means they don't have to make as many proteins, so they're actually conserving their resources. There are several types of atrophy. It would be important for you to know the different types of atrophy, how they work, and some examples of each. First, let's talk about disuse atrophy. If you've ever worn a cast for a broken bone, you likely experienced disuse atrophy. Casts are designed to immobilize an extremity above and below the bone break. If your arm is in a cast, then the bicep is not being used, so it will shrink or will atrophy from disuse. If a patient is on a ventilator for a long period of time, the diaphragm, which is a very large muscle may atrophy and that makes it difficult for patients to be able to move enough air in and out of the lungs on their own. A third example might be generalized weakness and muscle wasting from prolonged immobility. The second type of atrophy we're going to discuss is denervation atrophy. This is a form of disuse atrophy but in the case of denervation atrophy, a nerve that supplies a muscle group or organ is damaged. Most commonly, denervation atrophy involves skeletal muscle. And patients with spinal cord injury generally experience pretty significant muscle atrophy within the first few months after their injury due to denervation atrophy. Lack of hormonal stimuli can also cause atrophy. For example, breast tissue and sex organs with decreased estrogen exposure will shrink after menopause. Also, men who abuse testosterone may experience testicular atrophy. Inadequate nutrition frequently leads to atrophy. When cells are starved, either by physical starvation or by a reduced blood supply, the cells will shrink in size, and again, that is an attempt to decrease their energy requirements 
as a survival tactic. Hypertrophy is a strategy that cells use to help them mount a more effective response to increased demand. Hypertrophy results in increased cell size, but not an increase in the number of cells. Hypertrophy is common in cardiac and skeletal muscle. This makes a lot of sense since muscle cells cannot undergo mitotic division. Rather, genes are turned on to make new actin and myosin and to help increase the size of the organelles, but there is no mitosis, so the cells just get larger. No doubt you will at some point in your career have a patient with left ventricular hypertrophy. What type of pathology or disease might cause an increased demand on the left, ventri on the left ventricle that results in left ventricular hypertrophy? We'll talk more about this in another slide. Hypertrophy may be considered physiologic or pathologic. Physiologic hypertrophy is exactly as the name implies. It is an expected physiologic process that happens in response to exercise or other workload demands. Bodybuilding is a good example of normal physiologic hypertrophy. Other forms of hypertrophy happen because of disease conditions and these are considered pathologic. For example, if somebody has to constantly strain during urination in order to force urine through a partially blocked urethra, over time the urinary bladder wall will thicken as we're using those muscles more and placing more demand on them. People who donate a kidney or who lose a kidney from trauma will experience enlargement of the remaining kidney. This is a compensatory mechanism as one kidney is now doing the job of two. Also, people may donate a lobe of their liver for transplant. The remaining liver tissue will increase in size eventually to return to its normal size. So going back to the mention of left ventricular hypertrophy, if this happens related to hypertension or high blood pressure, which is the normal cause or the most common cause, would you recognize that this would be pathologic adaptive hypertrophy? Next, we're going to talk about the plasias. The term plasia literally means development. In hyperplasia, hyper means more, and plasia, development. So you have more cell development or an increase in cell number. Sometimes cells actually change from one type to another in response to stress. And that is metaplasia. And finally, we're going to talk more about dysplasia. These are cells that multiply in these deranged and disorganized patterns. As mentioned on the prior slide, hyperplasia refers to cells increasing in number, but not not rather than size. So they increase in number, but they don't necessarily get bigger. Hyperplasia is found in cells that are capable of splitting to form new cells, which means not muscle cells and not nerve cells. If people donate a large part of their liver, then the donor's liver will regenerate back to its original size. During pregnancy, breasts enlarge to prepare for lactation. Additionally, 
hormones can cause endometrium or prostate enlargement. Cells can multiply to protect tissue from overuse, and that, that is what happens with calluses on your hands and feet. The next type of plasia is metaplasia. Metaplasias are usually found in epithelial cells and they are reversible. Cells change their form to become a different type of cell in response to chronic irritation. The newly formed cells are better able to stand the circumstances where a more fragile cell might die. Long-term cigarette smokers, airways are commonly, are usually lined with ciliated columnar cells. I should say that's the healthy airway, but chronic exposure to smoke prompts the cells to change into stratified squamous epithelial cells. Sometimes patients with persistent heartburn have an incompetent valve between their esophagus and stomach. This causes stomach acid to reflux into the esophagus. The epithelial lining in the esophagus can actually change from a columnar type cell. Actually, the cells change from a flat epithelial type cell into columnar cells in response to the acid. Metapa all of these types of metaplastic changes are considered to be precancerous changes. Now let's talk about dysplasia. Dys means deranged or disorganized. Dysplasia is also associated with chronic irritation or inflammation. You can see in the image that the cells make up the, that make up the organ go from normal to larger than normal hyperplasia to varying degrees of disorganization. And then they finally invade the adjacent tissue. Um, an example of an invasive um, cellular changes would be um, the chronic irritation that is associated with the human papillomavirus or HPV can eventually cause cervical dysplasia. This is just another picture of dysplasia, probably of the respiratory tract. The top picture shows normal ciliated epithelial cells and the bottom picture demonstrates how chronic irritation changes the cell type and eventually results in dysplasia or a risk factor for cancer. Sometimes buildup of substances within a cell can trigger cells to adapt or change. These can be normal body substances or they might be products from outside the body. Some examples include fatty liver disease, and I believe that's what's shown on the picture um, in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. High levels of glucose in cells can trigger changes in small blood vessels in diabetes. And when red blood cells break down too quickly, we can have an abundance of bilirubin in the cells and that causes a yellow tint to the cells and to our skin. So those are all examples of normal body substances in too large of an amount that cause cell damage. If we have an abundance of glucose, we will store it as glycogen, which is a polysaccharide, and then a specific enzyme is required to break down the glycogen to glucose. If people don't have that enzyme, then um, glucose levels will fall because they're incapable of making glucose from glycogen. Cells also adapt in response to exogenous products, and these include coal dust, lead, and even pigments in tattoos. At this point, we're going to conclude part one of chapter three, and we're going to um, discuss 
further the causes of cell injury and more specific ways that the cells respond to injury in part two of chapter three.